Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, this panel discussion is on improving organisational resilience, what trustees need to consider. I'm Priya Singh, I'm chair designate at NCVO, and I'm really delighted to be chairing this morning's session. NCVO has organised this event as part of Trustees Week, which highlights the excellent work of trustees and supports boards to improve their governance. So this morning, we'll hear from our expert panellists on four of the areas we all need to consider as part of ensuring the resilience of our organisations. So I'm delighted to be joined by Ros Oakley from the Association of Chairs, who will speak about the importance of board leadership. And then Rui Dominguez from, chat from the charity Finance Group, who will address financial resilience. And Philip Kirkpatrick from Bates Wells, who will discuss collaboration and partnerships. We're also really pleased to be joined by Alice Rath, a young trustee at Crohn's and Colitis UK, who's joining us today. There are, of course, many aspects to ensuring diversity within your board. We won't have time to cover a lot of those today, but Alice will be sharing her experiences of being a young trustee and some tips that we all might like to know about um, thinking about involving young people on our boards. So there'll be an opportunity this morning to ask your questions of the panel and we'd be really pleased if you could submit those through the Q&A function and we'll answer as many of them as we can get to once we've heard from the panellists. We're also recording this session and the recording will be available on our website and we'll send you the link afterwards. You hopefully should have received a copy of the slides already via email. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ros Oakley, CEO of the Association of Chairs. Thank you, Ros, and over to you. Thank you, Priya. It's a real uh, pleasure to be talking to everybody today and happy Trustees Week to you. Um, the first thing I want to do actually is start by asking all of you a question, because it's always helpful for us as panelists to get a sense of where you're coming from. So. We'd like to ask you, how are you feeling about your board's performance during the crisis? And you have five options here. Very satisfied, quite satisfied, neutral, quite dissatisfied, or very dissatisfied. So we'll just give you a, just a, a moment or so to make your selections. And once you've done so, we'll be able to share the poll results so that you have a sense of how everybody else is feeling about their board's performance at the moment. I don't know whether your hands are hovering or whether it's really easy for you to make that choice. Let's see. OK, all right. Well, that's very encouraging in that the majority of you are quite satisfied or very satisfied. But for some of you, you're in that neutral position or quite dissatisfied. Thank you for that. Gives us good context. So moving on. The first thing I'd like to say is, reflect on is, we are all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. And you might have heard that before, and I make no apologies for repeating it, because I think whenever you're doing a, a session like this, I'm really conscious that circumstances are so different. You may be in a very small organisation, entirely volunteer-led. You may be in a large organisation with lots of staff. You may be in a good financial position or a very poor financial position. Um, you've got different skill sets and capacities in both your board and staff team. So that is going to influence how you're being affected at the moment, but also the best response for you. But despite all that variety, there are some common patterns and some uh, common learning that we can share. So what I'd like to do is just focus in next now on four perspectives. Uh, on the next slide, please. That I'm already seeing, we at Association of Chairs are already seeing playing out in boards that are testing leadership and resilience already and are gonna to continue to uh, influence how boards are reacting at the moment. The first one, is the personal. Now, it, it, it might sound quite obvious, but inevitably people are affected very differently by the pandemic at the moment. They might be affected by poor physical or mental health. They may have had a bereavement. They may have found that their caring responsibilities have changed. They may have lost their livelihood or then their work may have become much more busy at this time. 
So time, the t amount of time that trustees can put in may have been quite dramatically affected. It might have been increased or decreased. For some trustees, they've got great digital access and skills. For others, they, they just don't have those kinds of assets and resources at their capability. And increasingly, as we go through the pandemic, we're also noticing more and more exhaustion. People have given a lot. They've got a lot going on, a lot of change, and that's exhausting for people. And that, again, this plays out in different ways. For some people, the stresses of the current time are a short-term thing that they can weather. For others, there are going to be serious, long-lasting long difficulties for them. And for another minority but important group, this is actually going to be a period of growth. Sometimes these challenges bring out the very best in us, and people talk about this concept of post-traumatic growth. So as a chair or as a member of a board, it's worth thinking about what's going on for people individually. I think that's something we often don't talk about in boards. We often talk about boards as if they're just these um, machine-like decision-making machines. But now more than ever, we need emotional intelligence on our boards and to be aware of the way in which uh, different factors are affecting different people. The second perspective I just reflect on is the way in which the pandemic is complicating decision making. I mean, one aspect of kind of legal considerations about bringing people together, most of which I think we overcome and, and uh, Bates Wells put out really useful advice about, about that very early on in the pandemic. But there are also practical things about needing to make decisions faster and the scale of the decisions being made. Now, in some organisations, subgroups have formed, uh, often with very good, clear um, rules of engagement, uh, delegated authority, but sometimes it's been a bit ad hoc. Um, and decisions have been made at speed, often without as much information as you would want, often making a lot of demands on staff, if you have staff, to have good information at the very time when their capacity is incredibly stretched. And that can create um, difficulties uh, between the staff and the trustee team as you try and get good information to make decisions. And, and then on top of that, you're having to do all of that online. So you're not getting all the nuance that you might get. Sometimes it's quite difficult to do things uh, online. So the whole process of decision making has been disrupted by what's going on in the pandemic. And that, that's playing into the quality of the decision making and therefore resilience. The third factor I want to highlight is behavioural, which has impacted these these two ahead are, are affecting, that I've already covered, are affecting uh, behavioural. So you may find that on your board, the dynamics have really changed for you. People who you're used to showing up and being really engaged may now be absent. People who you're used to being a bit absent may now be incredibly engaged. Probably the dynamics between the board team and the staff team have changed, particularly if some of your senior team have been on furlough and the boards had to step in. Um, the other thing you, you may well find is that we behave to stress, uh, we react to stress and anxiety differently. And for some of us, for many of us, we, it, we displace it into different places. So if with so many things going on, this can come out about projecting our anxieties onto other people. So perhaps being overly critical um, and there being more conflict on the board than you are used to having. So all of that. Uh, and the sense perhaps of an inner cabal going on uh, can make the uh, the relationships in your board are really being tested. And that's also true of the chair chief executive relationship. We're certainly hearing reports of boards either pulling together really well and chair chief exec doing really well, but also the opposite, that there are much more friction going on. The fourth perspective I'd like to offer you is really around the strategic. Now, obviously, there's a real so many challenges going on financially and around the need and again this is playing out differently for some people there's a really heightened focus and sharpness of vision about what they are the need to focus on the mission and everybody's very motivated by that possibly some paradigm shifts going on about what's really important um, you may be rapidly rethinking business models or partnering with people you've never partnered with before and revisiting strategic choices. 
Um, the other thing that's coming to the fore very much is social inequality and greater focus on diversity and inclusion. So it may be quite an exciting time with change happening much faster than you would imagine, but equally at the other end, we're also seeing some boards that are really overwhelmed by what's going on and, and they're actually a bit frozen, not able to engage as they need to with the strategic. So I think it's just worth reflecting on what's going on in your board and whether you're noticing that. Perhaps you haven't noticed some of those factors yet, but they may yet come into play. The next thing I'd like to do is just um, moving on to the next side is just look at what do we know about what helps resilience. So I did a little look about what the academic literature says. And here are some of the factors. So the importance of taking care of yourself, which is why reflecting on what's going on for people personally matters as you think about it for yourself, but also about helping those around you on your board and staff teams. The importance of drawing on close relationships and trusted relationships. So those that already had good board relationships have got better resources to draw on. For those of you who are in the difficult position of difficult relationships already, that's probably harder, but you can still forge good relationships in these difficult times. They highlight the importance of shaping an optimistic outlook. I think that's a key role for the board at the moment. Um, amidst all the doom and gloom. And one of the ways of doing that is by building a sense of medium and long-term purpose. Very much the domain of the board about looking at, focusing on that mission and the strategic. And the need to combine a determination to move forward with an acceptance of what can't be changed or controlled. And again, I think that's really important to be clear. What is it you do have control of and what don't you? Uh, so you don't waste your effort on those things that you simply can't make a difference on. And also the importance of a balanced approach, both physically, emotionally, mentally and spiritually. So moving on to the next slide, please. Really, this next phase is all about choices, both conscious and unconscious. And by tending to this range of perspectives, we can help surface some of the unconscious choices we might be making. But and be more conscious. Um, I think we really are at a crossroads. I think our biggest danger is an absence of leadership, of boards feeling overwhelmed by the challenges, <clears throat> tired, um, divided or timid. And I think there the danger is of a spiral downwards. There is an alternative. This is an opportunity. The, the converse is it's an opportunity for creative thinking and for leading with optimism, for rethinking your strategic choices. So what we need right now from boards, from chairs, is good leadership, clear focus, optimism, creativity, courage, and looking for opportunity. For some of us, just as with a personal level, this is an opportunity for post-pandemic post growth. And I don't necessarily mean financial growth, but I mean growth in terms of how we do things pulling together uh, relationships and partnerships. So just moving on then to the next slide, please. Um, oh dear, lost my next set of points. So what helps um, resilience? So at an individual level, um, this is about taking care of yourself. Um, Um, but also taking care of others and looking out for one another. Tired and stressed people make, make mistakes. They get tetchy or if they're demoralised, they give up. So try and get ahead of this by looking after yourselves and by modelling good behaviour. Um, you can help people by putting in extra help. You might have an employee assistance programme. Maybe you can put it in place. I know we did in our organisation. It was cheaper than we thought it would be. Um, it's okay to show vulnerability and to admit you need help, um, but also to recognise for some people it's a period of growth. At board level, it's very much about ensuring the organisation is ready for the next stage. Help shape that optimistic outlook um, for the, um, and clarify purpose for medium and long term. Focus on the mission and be open to paradigm shifts. Revisit what success looks like and your choices. Think about what still serves you at the moment and what no longer does. Um, bring in new recruits, new skills and mindsets. And at a sector level, this is about supporting good governance. 
good governance doesn't happen magically. We have to invest in it. Um, so the need for to help people with change management, effective governance and collaboration. I think it's worth saying as we look at this period that remember every single one of our organisations once was just an idea. It was built by individual after individual, team after team, who were willing to keep their eyes on the prize and keep on overcoming obstacles to make that idea a reality. We've done it before, we can do it again. So I'd just like to end with some wisdom from Einstein with my final slide. Imagination is everything. It is the preview of life's coming attractions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ros, and I, and I regret that you can't hear the round of applause that I can see there, so thank you. And um, they're really interesting points, and I'm sure there are going to be a number of questions. I'd like to introduce now Rui Dominguez, our next panellist. Rui is Director of Finance and Operations at the Charity Finance Group. Thank you, Rui. Thank you, Priya, um, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, we've got a session now on financial resilience and my name is Rui Dominguez, I'm from the Charity Finance Group. If you've not come across that charity before, we are a charity that's there to support your finance teams, uh, your treasurers um, in the sector. We are, are there to inspire um, you to be financially confident, to be financially dynamic and to be trustworthy in how you manage the resources that are given to you. You can find out more about our charity from our website cfg.org.uk so I'm not going to go into a lot of that now because what I really want to go into is to look at financial resilience. This is, I, I am certain that for you as trustees you have had a an enormous focus on this area over the last few months. It's probably dominated every agenda for, for six if not longer months this year and I think it will still be a focus going forward. This isn't something that's going to stop in the next couple of months, we can see that this, this need to, to look at the, the financial health and the ability of our organisations to withstand the storms and that picture that Ros put up was, was fantastic, that you know, we are all experiencing this storm, but in different ways. And making sure that our boats can hold well in that storm, be financially resilient, is something that's going to be on your agendas for months and years to come, I believe. Now, over the next 10 minutes or so. I'm just going to take you through a few things that I think you need to be looking at as, as trustees. I am really hoping that over the next 10 minutes, you learn nothing new and that actually you are doing all of this already in your boards and that you, you sit there and think, yeah, tick, 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 tick. We do all of that on our boards. If you do that, fantastic. But I'm really, really hoping that at some point you hear a snippet over the next few minutes that you think, oh, we've still got to look at that side of things. We've still got to consider that as we look at the financial resilience of our organisation. So apologies that 90% of this is going to be old hat to you. Um, I'm really hoping the 10% will be of use to you. And of use to you because we're not here just to look after our finances. I try and say that everywhere um, I go, that actually we're here to look after our finances so we can deliver our benefits to our beneficiaries. We're here to look after people and deliver public benefits to people. That's, we're not here just to look after money. So the, the first thing, if you can move on to the next slide, that'd be great. Yeah, the, the first thing is probably the focus that we've had for the last few months. It's been about cash flow. Cash is the lifeblood of, of every organisation and we've all been trying to manage our cash the best we can. And that's because that is the immediate financial situation that's in front of you. So when you are looking at your cash flows and I'm hoping that you're not just looking at a short time scale for that. I, I'm hoping that when you're looking at your cash flows, you are looking further forward, maybe a month, uh, a quarter, six months, a year ahead in your cash flow forecasting. Your auditors will be requiring you to, to do that sort of analysis as part of your audit. So it should be something that's part of, part of what you look at regularly. How regularly? It's going to depend on how urgent that is as a situation for you. And, and it will also, 
I've seen a couple of organizations that when they've done their cash flows over over this time, it's it's created a sense of, oh, actually, there is urgency here. There is something we need to do right now to fix our cash situation. And that's been great. But there have been others that, that when they've looked at their cash flow, they've looked at what that modeling looks like for the next six months. It's taken some of the pressure out as well. It's taken some of the heat out of some of the conversations and meant that, that actually people could just pause and reflect and do all that work that Ros was saying about considering what does the medium and the long term look like rather than just perhaps a knee jerk response to what thinking that you might run out of cash today. And if you're looking at the cash flow side of things, there are things that you can do. There are still government loan schemes available. You can still apply for them. There are the job retention scheme. Um, there are the job support scheme when that comes through as well. Do look at those. And if you want some guidance on that, we've got some at CFG. You, the networks that you're part of will have information on that. Charity Tax Group have got information on that as well. So you don't have to try and figure out the government legislation yourself. There are places to get that information and there are all sorts of resources we've put towards the end of this presentation for you to use um, to try and help you with that if we can move on to the next slide please so once you've got over that urgency once you've got over the cash flow side of things I'm imagining that probably the focus has been how do we balance our costs and our income to deliver the services or the things that we're looking to deliver um, Accountants love to complicate things, but actually finance is a really simple equation. Money in and money out, income and costs. Now, it will get more complex for your organization and there will be all sorts of nuances to how you do things. But actually, if you just keep those two things in mind, what, how can we stabilize or increase our income and what can we do to, to reduce or, or somehow look to, to to stabilize the cost side of things too. Are there things we can do to minimize? Are there things around collaborations that we can do with other organizations to reduce our costs? Are there things around, again, some of the, the government support um, that's available for salaries, for rent, for other things? Um, there might be specific things in your network that people are aware of that can help you with reducing your costs. Or what can you do to protect or increase income. For us at CFG, this has been a, a particularly um, difficult time because we normally deliver all of our services face to face and we just can't do conferences. You can't do training events. So we've had to, to pivot everything to, to look at delivering them digitally. Um, and that's one way, the, the major way we've looked to actually protect our income. But our other major income sources are membership income. So We've got to make sure that we're delivering benefits to our members, to you as charities who are the members of CFG, to make sure that um, actually you see the benefits of what we give you. Your reserves, your reserves are there for rainy days. And if this isn't the rainiest days we've ever seen, I don't know what is. You know, I've been working in the sector for about 20 years. This is the storm that reserves are there to help us weather. So actually, it is about looking at your, your general or your unrestricted reserves. If you've designated reserves, do you need to bring them back into your general reserves um, and use them in a different way? Have you looked at your restricted reserves and gone back to those funders and said, can we use it in a different way? Funders are really open to those conversations. They, they might say no, but they're open to having the conversation about it at least. And finally, when you look at this area, it is about looking at whether your business model is fit for, for purpose. Uh, CFG, like I've said, we've pivoted to digital. There are so many organizations that are now pivoting to digital models. Was our model fit for purpose? Yes, for the world we lived in at the time. Does it fit with now? No, we've got to change it. We've got to change our model. If we go to, to the next slide, please. And then it's it's really once you've establish the urgency with the cash flow and you've looked at what you can do in the medium term it is what does that new normal look like what is that strategic piece of thinking that you need to do as as trustee boards around what does the new normal for our organization look like have you established indicators that recovery is there within your organization we've got within within cfg a couple of things that we're doing we're looking at uh, the take up of our annual conference that's taking place in December. Is that take up sufficiently high to indicate that that recovery in that area has taken place? 
we're looking at our membership renewals for next year. What are some of the early indicators there that tell us that recovery has been established in that area? And one of the things I would really praise our board for over the last year is actually they have really slimmed down the ask from us as a staff team. We've got people on furlough, we've got people trying to deliver so many different things and look at so much legislation to understand how to operate that actually they've slimmed down what they require from us to very few key indicators, but the key indicators and very little financial information apart from the really key financial information. There's something you can do to take some of the, the burden off your teams by looking at what indicators you have, what's your frequency and type of monitoring is something you can look at. Don't get rid of everything, but look at what is really key to you at the moment. Scenario planning. Scenario planning is, is oh, you could plan for so many scenarios at the moment and it's you could be asking your teams to do every scenario under the sun. Really think through as a board, what are the realistic scenarios we do think we need to look at. Don't ask for everything, ask for the realistic ones that you think you need to look at. And again, coming back to early warning signs, what are some of the key indicators you need to put in place to keep you looking at, well, are we on that road to recovery? So I'm hoping that some of those bits are bits you're already doing, really hoping that all of those bits you're already doing. But I think I just want to end on one thing, and I think Ros touched on this as well. I think it's probably a theme that's going to come across in presentations everywhere for the next few months, and, and that's about personal resilience. I really do think that financial resilience for an organisation starts with the personal resilience of trustees, chairs, finance teams, senior teams, the whole team within charities. And um, one of the, the people who's been involved with CFG for a while, a lady called Nikki Deason, wrote a blog back in, in April. You can read it in about 30 seconds. Um, and actually it just looks at these three areas around um, <laughs> personal resilience. Because I do, there was an article yesterday, I don't know if people saw it in civil society, that actually said that finance teams are are working 60 hour weeks at the moment to try and keep their organizations going. That's not sustainable in the long term. That's not sustainable in the long term at all. So you need, we need to be looking after our people. Um, and you've got a couple of points on there. The, the one about uh, looking after yourself in a crisis is just about making sure that your own well-being is right. I think Ros touched on that, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth on that side of things. Um, but I think there is something about, as a trustee board, creating a psychologically safe place for your teams as well. There is something about your responsibility to be available, to be visible, so that people can ask you questions, for you to be communicating with um, your staff teams around what is your thinking as well. I think in the absence of information, people create nightmare stories that aren't the reality of what you're looking at as a trustee board. So actually being able to communicate that well is, is really important and asking your staff team how things are going. I think putting yourself in that place where you can ask your chief exec, your, your finance director, the rest of your teams, how they are doing really helps. And the last point really around supporting your team is around making sure that your teams are still taking holiday, making sure that they're not responding to things at 2 a.m. in the morning, that they they aren't working all of those hours because actually that will lead to, to well, they won't be financial, they won't be resilient, and therefore things will go wrong. Things could go wrong in your organization if people are psychologically and physically and mentally stretched too far. So I think there are lots of sources of information. I'm hoping you've picked up a, a couple of snippets, like I say, within this. But I think the key thing for me is keeping your organization financially resilient is not about just the money. It is about what you're still looking to deliver. It is about what you're looking to achieve for your beneficiaries. Finances and your teams are a resource to achieve that. And there are ways to keep that financial resilience there as you look to deliver the amazing things you're looking to deliver. Thank you. Fantastic, Rui. Thank you so much. And lots of helpful things for us to think about there. And great to see that theme of personal res resilience and personal care coming through, uh, particularly when we're talking about finances, so thank you. We're now going to move to Philip Kirkpatrick, who's Head of Charity and Social Enterprise at Bates Wells. Welcome, Philip, and thank you. 
Thanks very much. Uh, and thanks, uh, Rui and Roz. Um, uh, excellent presentation. Sorry, you've probably just heard a bong go through on my computer. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, OK. Um, and um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, collaboration and, and merger. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about these as ends and ideals in and of themselves. I want to, to talk about these in the context of, of this uh, seminar, which is about resilience. Uh, there's a lot of uh, people talking a lot all the time about merger and collaboration and why, why charities don't do it more. And um, most of that commentary does actually come from people who don't know that much about charity, but think that they do. Um, but also quite a lot of um, uh, resistance to it comes from people who do know about charity, but just don't want to. Um, and sometimes they have good reasons as well. Uh, so if we could go on to the, or very often they have good reasons, if we go on to the next slide. Um, so it's not a thing that we're, we're aiming and pushing people uh, towards, um, especially now. We're, we're, we're looking at uh, resilience. And I thought I'd therefore just ask the question, uh, uh, what is resilience for? Uh, is resilience about the um, the survival of your charity, or is resilience about uh, the delivery, effective delivery of your charity's purposes? And I would like to uh, suggest to you that uh, while a lot of people are, are, are concentrating on trying to make sure that their organization can survive through this crisis, actually, at all times, what people should be thinking about is um, what should be done now and, and at any time in order to better deliver the charity's purposes. Um, and frankly, everything that you are trying to do and every decision you're trying to take at every point of the charity's life should be about trying to achieve the purposes and what is the best way of doing that. Uh, I say that, however, there is a caveat to that. If your organization, if you're, if, let's say you're a limited company that's particularly applicable to a company, if the company is insolvent, that is, it can't pay its debts as they fall due, effectively, um, and you ought to know that there's no reasonable prospect of avoiding going bust, suddenly your, your aim, everyone has always told you that what you're doing there as a trustee is to try to achieve the purposes suddenly your aim changes uh, and you suddenly have a duty not to beneficiaries not to the purposes but a duty to um, creditors and that makes life very uncomfortable and difficult for a charity trustee uh, but until that point you're aiming at all times to try uh, to deliver the purposes and so there's a question here do you need to survive in order to deliver the purposes? Does your organization need to survive? And the answer to that uh, is not necessarily, or my answer to that is not necessarily. Uh, what I think um, it's, worth, it's worth asking is what is called the Stevens question. And the Stevens question is a question that is written, uh, I think, I've never been in it, uh, on the boathouse door of the Cambridge University Boat Club. And as you walk in through the door, there is a question that confronts you. Every six foot 10, um, enormous, uh, muscly rower is confronted by a single question when they walk through the boathouse door, and that is, will it make the boat go faster? Everything that will make the boat go faster is done. Everything that will not make the boat go faster is completely ignored. Now, I know that's a rather purist approach to, um, to uh, uh, dr driving at anything, but it, it, it's, it's a great example to have in one's mind about um, trying to achieve a purpose. What is the purpose? What will enable us to do that? And I want, just picking up Ros Rosalind's um, quest, uh, comment, that this is a moment for new thinking. 
well, what charities do brilliantly is new thinking. What charity trustees and staff do brilliantly is new thinking. Um, but this is a moment to have some new thinking again about how, how to deliver. And should we be delivering by just carrying on doing what we've always done or are there other ways of, of doing it? And maybe collaborating or merging with an organization uh, is an appropriate way of trying to deliver your purpose better. And when you're thinking about um, trying to make the boat go faster, it's also worth thinking about when you're trying to make that decision. Uh, picking up uh, again, uh, Ros's uh, analogy and well, Ros's um, um, picture, uh, that picture, I don't know if you studied it carefully, but that picture is a picture of a 19th century lifeboat going out to um, collect people from a wreck with people anxiously calling and crying from the shoreline. Uh, and yes, a certain amount of, um, of change and, 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 uh, and bailing out might just make the boat go faster, but actually what they're mostly dealing with at this point in time is bailing out so that the boat doesn't sink. Uh, that's not a great time to be starting to think about collaborative working and merger. Uh, the time to be thinking about collaborative working and merger uh, is when, um, when the organization is healthy, and you can think of, can you, can you achieve this? Because uh, if you're thinking about it at the wrong moment, you're looking for help for charity from someone else whose interests may not be uh, to support your organization to survive. And as a result, the work of your organization might fail. It might not pass on to someone else. Uh, and there's no point um, trying to uh, have, have new thinking or, uh, doing something different if, if the end result is, is just going to be collapse and, and spending more money to achieve something less. So are you about going faster or are you about bailing out? And really you want to be about going faster. Uh, so could we move on to the next slide? Uh, this just sets out some thoughts about why collaboration uh, may be beneficial and uh, will it make your boat go faster? And I won't go through, you have the slides, you've had them in, in advance. So I won't go through all of those um, little balloons there. Uh, there's probably a number, any, any number of things you could add to that, but there's some ideas about things like uh, sharing knowledge and skills, you know, uh, having other people come in and pre perform certain tasks that they do better than you when you might then perform certain tasks that they do better than, than um, that, that you do better than they do. Uh, and just thinking about ways in which you can do things better. So I won't go through everything on that on that slide. I just want to move on now to talk about br briefly about how how you go about sort of typical models for collaboration and merger. So if we could have the next slide, thank you. Um, the the, uh, the 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 top three or probably the the the, the first four of these things are, are really what we think of as as collaboration. And you can do it incredibly informally. Do you just put together some kind of um, uh, discussion forum, alliance, or uh, something where you will um, support each other to achieve uh, the, the work that you want to, to achieve? And there's nothing that's binding in that. It's just people working together and agreeing to cooperate, but not being, not being bound by it and not having any obligations. Uh, you can then move on to um, a contractual alliance where you say, OK, we, we all know what we want to do. Uh, we're all going to depend on each other for certain things that we've agreed to do. And so we're going to have a contract that says, um, you'll do X and we'll do Y and together we hope to achieve Z. And you can, you can create a contract that does that. Uh, I mean, that contract might not be something you'd ever think of suing on. You want to get some, you know, if, if things go wrong, but it's certainly a, uh, a committed um, form of a, of a collaboration where everybody knows that they are bound to do something and it's a very very significant promise you can move on from that to something uh, which we would call a joint venture and the different ways of setting up a joint venture but a, a classic one is to establish a new entity that will uh, be established to achieve a particular purpose that you both wish to or many any any number of you wish to achieve and 
uh, that new entity will need funding and so on. And so you you create the joint venture entity, you have a joint venture agreement behind that, uh, that, that entity which explains what each of you are going to do. And essentially, you're going to be funding it, you're going to be providing other resources to it, and you'll be part of the governance structure of it, but it will be a separate entity achieving a particular thing. Moving more in, along the lines of, um, of merger rather than pure uh, collaboration are the, the bottom three of those. Uh, first of all, hiving off activities. You may, have look, you may have done the kind of analysis that uh, Rui has suggested that you would do, and you may have reached the conclusion that actually this particular activity is not something that you're doing well, or not something that you can do profitably. Uh, not that you have to make a profit uh, and distribute that, but you have to have, if, if you're losing money rather than making money uh, you've, uh, on a particular activity, you've got to know that you've got the money to cover it from somewhere. It may be that someone else can do this better than you can do it. Uh, or it may be that there's someone out there who's running something that really you could do better than them at. And uh, so it's a question of picking an activity and transferring that activity with all its assets and with all its liabilities uh, from one entity to another. Uh, and then that, that's, if you go to the, the, the far right of that picture where it says full merger, that would essentially be hiving off all of the activities of one organization to another, all of the assets and all of the liabilities from one organization to another. Um, and, uh, and then the, the, the one who's done the transfer see, probably ceasing eventually uh, to exist. Um, and when you do that sort of hive off of those activities, staff transfer, um, assets transfer, maybe even trustees transfer, maybe they become part of the new, the new governing structure of the, of, the, of the entity. And the other way of doing a, um, a merger is to create a group structure so that you have, and it's probably easier now if I move on to the next slide and just show you uh, the next two slides and show you some of some of these. So um, the first one is is um, asset transfers, which uh, merges by by carrying out an asset and liability transfer. And you can see in each of them, there's there's one organisation A, B, or C, which is is sort of blurred out, and one which is um, solid. And that's there to, to to indicate that in the top line, A is transferring all of its assets and all of its liabilities to B. And then the blurring out is suggesting that in due course, A will cease to exist. And you might um, do it another way. In fact, very often mergers are not done in that simple way by transferring assets from A to B. Um, uh, much to my uh, disapproval very often, <laughs> um, for, for reasons which have very little bearing with um, benefit to, the, to either of the organizations and achievement of the purpose, neither of the organizations wants to feel that it's been taken over and so there's a certain amount of ego natural human ego that that slips in and people say we don't want to transfer our assets from a to b and, and lose our identity everyone should do the same thing so they set up a new charity and everyone trans both, both or more than one organization transfers their assets and liabilities to that new organization so that's very, I would say that's much more common than A to B. A to B is probably uh, what happens in a crisis and sometimes happens uh, in, in a non-crisis. Uh, B to C, B and C to A is what more often happens when organizations are merging. It's a more merger of equals, people like to think of it. Um, can I have the next slide, please? The group structures are different and you can see in this case, uh, none of the organizations are blurred out. All of them continue to exist. So what typically would happen, let's say they're limited companies, what typically would happen is that A becomes the sole member of B. B's trustees remain in place. A's trustees remain in place. And the activities of both organizations continue. But they have created a group structure where there's a parent and a subsidiary and that enables them more easily to align policies, procedures, perhaps um, align certain staff functions and reduce costs overall for the group. Uh, it might also involve some asset transfers between A and B and they could be going either way but ultimately you're creating a group structure and probably you need 
for example, you don't need to have all of the functions of both organizations in both organizations. You may have um, all of your finance function uh, or most of your finance function, much of your HR function, um, much of your uh, business, your um, uh, fundraising uh, and, and other functions uh, with, you know, as a joint function of the group and therefore reducing your costs. And then the ABC model there is just indicating that that parent subsidiary uh, arrangement can run across any number of subsidiaries and there are there are several examples of, of charity groups where there is a parent entity and many subsidiary charities carrying out certain functions. Uh, is there another slide would you mind moving on? Uh, yes there is. So I just want to finish off with uh, my, my what I call my clear-eyed view of going into this because this is not a panacea I'm not saying merge, collaborate, it's the best thing since sliced bread, it's going to save all of your problems. It could be a good idea and it could be a terrible idea and you need to think about that. Um, so here are the questions that I think you should think of. How will your combined capabilities improve outcomes and how can you be better governed? How can you be better managed? Will this enable you to get more income? Will this enable you to save more costs? So those are the kind of really positive things to think about when you're thinking about merger or collaboration. But think also about the risks. There'll be a lot of effort in going through a due diligence exercise to understand the risks that you're taking on in giving away potentially all of your assets to another organization. Will it go bust tomorrow? How do you know it won't? Um, so that, that, those kinds of risks you will be trying to analyze. Um, if you're going to take on one of those organizations, will taking on the liabilities of that organization cause yours to go bust? So there are, or, or severe financial difficulties. Then you've got to start thinking about what it will cost. And there are, I've, I've identified sort of four principal costs, and you may think of others. One is the actual transaction cost of doing it, employing lawyers and accountants um, to go through all of the de detail and help you get through that process. Then there's disruption cost of just, the faff of doing this um, and, and, and just everyone uh, concentrating on, on that one thing, the anxiety that's caused by it, the staff time that will be thrown into dealing with that disruption uh, and generally the morale, how, how will morale be affected? Because that will have a cost on the organization in many ways, which needs to be thought about. So that was just making sure you have a clear eyed view if you're gonna go down this path and um, think about it, um, but don't feel pressured into doing this. I'll just finish by one thing is to say, we at Bates Wells have been gearing up to think we probably ought to be seeing quite a lot of merger and collaboration work in the sector. Um, because as people start to think, how do we get through the crisis? I can tell you now we're not seeing much. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, another excellent presentation, and it's so good to have your clear-eyed view there, so thank you. And um, let me now bring in Alice. So thank you, Alice, for join, joining us today, and you're going to share your experiences as a young trustee. Yes, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone, and happy Trustees Week. My name is Alice Rath. I am a young trustee for Crohn's and Colitis UK, and I am also a trustee, um, sorry, a trustee ambassador for the Young Trustees Movement. So I wanted to start today um, just with a little question to ask you if you have a trustee on your board. So I've got some options here, yes, no, or you're recruiting. So it'd be great to get your thoughts on that. I don't know if the poll's launched, so we can move on if that's not possible. OK, so um, a bit of background um, on me and how I became a trustee. Um, I was a patient for Great Ormond Street for 12 years. I have a rare and undiagnosed gastro condition, which got me involved in their youth room at the age of 14. I was very excited to be able to talk directly with the chief executive and talk to him about the main reasons why they should be improving patient care, specifically for teenagers in the hospital. And that was the start of my journey into the charity sector and more of 
importantly focusing on youth voice and how we can champion that. Um, I worked as a digital marketer across the sector um, and fell in love with the idea of charity and wanted to be involved from all aspects. I wanted to be a trustee but didn't know it was possible from such a young age. It wasn't until I was at working at Macmillan Cancer cancer support when I came across the young trustees movement one day on Twitter I realized that there was a whole group of young people who were working as trustees they were doing incredible work and I realized that I too could also support an organization as a trustee myself um, and it was that point where I um, applied to be a trustee for Crohn's Colitis UK where I've been in post for a year now um, just to move on, I'd like to talk about some of the challenges for young people to become trustees. So as I briefly touched on, I think the main thing is awareness around young people who are doing incredible things across the voluntary sector that don't realise that trusteeship is an option for them. There's also a limited number of opportunities. Actually, only 3% of trustees under the age of 30 exist. So there's a lot of gaps and we need to make sure that it's more widely known that young people can be trustees. Another point to note, which was a huge factor for me and the reason why I didn't start applying for trusteeship was confidence. Again, young people making sure that they're equipped with the resources that they need so they can have that confidence to apply for a role that they would be incredible at. And finally is tokenism. We see some organisations who really do value the um, the voice of young people and others that may feel pressured to bring on a young trustee from a tokenistic point of view. Um, so those are some of the challenges but I also wanted to talk about some of the benefits of having a young trustee. Um, for me I think the most important thing is representation. So the young trustees movement is an intersectional movement so it talks about diversity but the main spotlight is on young people. Having representation um, on your board is so important, making sure that your board is fully representative of the society we live in today. I also feel like a young person can bring a new perspective. Different generations have different challenges and that can be really helpful in supporting your beneficiaries. Having a new person on the board, whether they've been a trustee before or not, they may begin to challenge the status quo, which can only help you with evolving your boards. Young people can bring a whole new level of enthusiasm. I know at the start of my career, I was the most enthusiastic young person in the world. So young people can bring that to the board. And finally, a line of succession, being able to bring on young people so they are aware of what trusteeship is involved. You can mentor them and also create a incredible generation of young trustees that will lead the sector in years to come. I wanted to do um, a little um, bit of information on how you can support a young trustee, but just caveat here that I think all this uh, would be really beneficial for any new, tr any new trustee, whether you're young or not. Um, the first is to ask their opinion. Um, some new trustees may feel a bit shy at board level, so I think it's really important to make sure that their voice is heard and to ask them directly what they think. Mentoring from another board member can be really beneficial. I was very privileged to have this opportunity at Crohn's and Colitis UK. It made me feel really confident going into the boardroom. I felt like I had a friend there, someone who already knew me. Um, an opportunity to have regular one-to-one -one catch ups with the chair could be very beneficial. Um, it's an opportunity for um, the chair to learn more about the trustee on the board, um, but also the opportunity to talk with that person directly and have that mentorship. The other is one-to-one -one sessions with relevant directors or team members. This is a good opportunity to learn more about the organisation and the people you'll be collaborating with. Um, and that leads me on to introduction to the organisation. Crohn's and Colitis did an incredible day where we learn um, about all their services and their marketing and the projects they were working on. I got to meet all the passionate people that were working with the charity and it just left me leaving with um, all the enthusiasm in the world and feeling really privileged to be part of that organisation. And finally is to share resources. When I became a trustee, I had no idea where to go or where to start. So giving them a list of resources or things that they can go to for training and upskilling will be very beneficial. Um, so I wanted to leave with a slide um, put together by the Young Trustees Movement. 
Um, and this is just all the principles around good governorship that um, boards have that champion young trustees. Um, so this includes accessibility, so making sure that um, your boards are accessible for people with um, board leadership backgrounds or not, um, the culture, having a sense of belonging, and the purpose of your trustee role. Um, hopefully you'll see that your board will have these attributes, meaning that you will be able to bring on a young trustee yourselves. Um, if you would like to find out more about this, I will put a link to this in the chat, but the Young Trustees Movement is running a training session where you can find out more and you can become a champion yourself. And you'll also be able to sign a pledge to show that you care about improving board diversity, specifically bringing on more young trustees. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Alice. That was really helpful. Great to hear your experiences and so many tips for us there. I know that we're certainly going to take that up. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move us now to answering some of the questions that have been submitted for the panel. Um, so bear with us as I move to a different screen to have a look at the questions so that I can read them out. And I, and I just want to say at this point, a huge thank you to Claire Legg and Rupinda Daliwell, who are the two people who are running this whole show and have made it absolutely brilliant. So thank you. Um, and all errors are mine, so bear with me. Okay, so the first one are what are the main themes the panel have seen from board leaders in terms of challenges, opportunities and solutions? Who would like to start us off on that? Ross. Sure, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think in terms of the challenges, some of those I've, I've touched on, I think certainly finances <laughs> this movie is highlighted it's been one of the very few organizations that haven't been challenged there are some to be fair there are some who who are in a better financial position but for, for most of us in the financial uh, aspects board dynamics um chair chief executive relationships i think are some of the key things um the fundraising environment it's very uncertain certainly for some people, there are all the opportunities around pandemic-related uh, funding, but many of the standard funding programmes uh, have, have closed for, for new bids. Uh, and the whole question of operating models would be, be the kind of main challenges. In terms of opportunities, I think for those that have the, the capability or the possibility of doing things digitally, it's the amount of change that has happened over the last six months is extraordinary and i certainly you know we we were already at our organization association of chairs delivering things digitally but we've really ramped that up um and we were uncertain about how fast to go with our digital expansion because we didn't know how many chairs who on the whole tend to be an older group would be willing to engage with webinars and we're seeing fantastic engagement i know many organizations are saying they've moved on at a pace that's kind of taken them 10 years forward to what they would otherwise have done. So that that's an opportunity. Obviously, it's not a panacea. The whole issues around digital exclusion and not all services can be delivered to digi digitally. Um, I think the other thing is a sharpened understanding of the, of the extent of social inequality and the need for us as a sector to really get serious about diversity and inclusion. So I've seen it again we've responded to that at our organization we've put on events around diversity and inclusion we're seeing a lot of engagement um, and obviously we've heard from alice about young trustees but there's a whole range of people who aren't in the boardroom who really should be in the boardroom um i think um where it's going well we're seeing people really pulling together well i think the other thing is some there's been some great good practice by funders um so some of them are particularly those who already got the importance of core funding and unrestricted funding. I hope we're going to see more of that. Um, the other thing I'm seeing at a sector level is the co 
collaboration and cooperation between infrastructure organizations. I know I, I'm on a weekly call with NCVO, Akivo, Navco, you know, about now about 50 of us who, who up to 50 of us who meet weekly and, and really good collaboration going on. Um, I think around solutions, uh, it's the willingness to rethink what, what we're doing and, and who we're doing it with um, would be the key areas where I'm seeing um, solutions coming forward. Thank you. Thank you, Roz. Would anybody else like to contribute? Yes, uh, I would like to just touch on as a digital marketer, I am really pleased to see the digital evolution in the sector, uh, which is obviously a, um, a, a huge asset at the moment. And um, just to caveat, though, I know this is a challenge for a lot of organisations at the moment who don't feel um, that they've had time to catch up. It's definitely a sink or swim moment. So I would just encourage them to look for free resources and support. There's lots out there. Um, digital doesn't have to be challenging. It's a really good way to speak to people at mass. So um, please don't be scared. There is lots of free support out there. Um, and just to touch on the diversity aspect again, like Ross said, there are so many people that should be at board level that aren't, um, you know, talking about people who um, don't have a higher education, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. This is an opportunity for really for us to reflect on the sector, the gaps where we need to support people. So again, um, I think it's a time for us to reflect and actually start taking action. Thank you, Alice. Can I bring Rui in now? Yeah, just a, just a couple of, of minor things to add to that. I think one of the things that we've seen as, as a challenge um, is really around workplace mental health, workplace health as well for our teams, um, for people delivering our services. Um, don't lose, I'd, I'd really urge you not to lose focus on that, but actually in amongst all the important work that we do, um, actually there's, there's a lot of, and possibly more coming, uh, more mental health issues around how we've had to work and just what this this whole pandemic is is bringing to bear in terms of pressure on individuals and organisations. So I think I think in terms of one of the challenges, I think that's at a board level. I think that's one that you, you should, probably shouldn't ignore. Um, and just picking up on, on what Rosalind said as well, that actually um, you're not in this alone. There are sector umbrella bodies to be part of. There are other organisations who will be delivering other services that you can talk to and collaborate with. Um, and there's something about bringing our voices together to, to actually talk to central government about what the sector needs in terms of support at the moment. I think there are times that we feel like we've sort of fallen between the cracks um, in some of the conversations that government has been having with, with other sectors um, and with other parts of, the, uh, of life in the UK. Um, but I think it's when we come together as uh, as a sector, as uh, joint voices, then actually our voice has more power. So keying into some of those networks, I think is really quite important in terms of a, both an opportunity and a possible solution for quite a few of us too. Thank you. Philip? Um, so I was going to pick up on that mental health uh, point that uh, Rui and, and, and others have made and just point out that employers generally have been much more engaged in the in the idea of workplace mental health uh, and that was starting uh, before the pandemic but never has it been needed needed more um i wanted to talk a little bit about then then boards I mean, the problem with talking to um lawyers and doctors and so on is that they very often just sort of see the worst and and um you know they, they they're, they're thrown up problems and they see the problems far more than they see solutions and the solutions that they're trying to have are solutions to the more intractable problems um but just in relation to the the board um and despite all the positive things that um alice and rosalind have rightly said about um trusteeship never has it been um, never have there been more reasons not to be a trustee than there are now, I would say. Never have there been more reasons um, to think very, very carefully before you take on that role. And uh, I, I, I really, really sympathise that as somebody who uh, is a trustee and has been a trustee and probably, if I can bear it, do it again. I mean, I still am one. Um, but bearing all that in mind bearing in mind the kind of uh 
uh, approach that you get from the Charity Commission and, and others about how um, basically uh, you're in the firing line, it's all your fault when everything goes wrong, and we're going to hold you to account. Uh, bearing in mind that that is actually being attempted to be done at this moment in the High Court in relation to the kids' company trustees. Um, we need to do more to try to make trustees um, feel valued, to make it feel that the, the job is worthwhile, uh, and to make it feel fun. And bearing in mind how difficult it is for employees who are full-time engaged to be, uh, or you know, heavily engaged, they may not be full-time, um, to be uh, fully involved during this rather distance working period. Just think how hard that is for trustees who are um, at, at best uh, remote, um, even when we don't have to operate remotely. So how do we engage them? And I don't have I don't have solutions to that, but I think people should should be thinking about managing that with boards being at an extra distant distance and knowing that. They, um, they, they carry the can. Philip, thank you. And I, I couldn't agree more about um, the basis of, of encouraging trusteeship and, and coming forward. And I think to some extent you've anticipated our next question. So I'd like to, to build on that. Our, our, our next contribution is the pandemic will inevitably cause a degree of churn at board level trustees not wanting this level of commitment, some trustees not stepping up, strategies changing and different skills being needed, etc. What should and could board, boards and chairs be doing to address this, either now or when things settle down? I think it is one of those questions that really does make, make us think. So, Ros. I was just conscious I spoke first last time and I, did, I wanted to give my colleagues a chance. Um, I think the, the reality is some trust, this is going to be too much for some trustees. Um, I, I hesitate to give general advice or a general view on this because I think it's going to change. I think um, for some people, the right thing to do is going to be to step back. I mean, they, they, they've got too much going on in their lives. They can't actually bring anything to the board. I think for you as a chair, if you're thinking about it as a chair, or indeed somebody who's talking with your chair as a, as a trustee, kind of the questions to ask yourself is, is this a temporary situation if it's disengagement by the trustee, or is it a permanent one? Um, if they think they're going to um, escape their finance, if, if, if it's financially driven, um, it, it's perhaps worth pointing out it, it's not going to solve that problem. Um, you're still liable uh, for a period of time. I'm sure Philip can comment on that if he needs to, uh, just in case that's driving it. But if if they really can't help, then you know I, I think in, encourage them to go um, and do think about recruiting. Um, for some people, some people feel overwhelmed by the idea of recruiting for new trustees at the moment. But I, I know that there, that certainly reach, and I believe trustees unlimited are finding that there is an increase in number of people who are interested in serving on trustee boards at, at, at this moment. It is perfectly possible to recruit online. You can do that, um, and I think as you change what the priorities of the board are now and what it needs, you are going to need to refresh those skills and to create space for, for new voices and indeed new energy to come in. Um, so I don't think we can give you a definite, here's the right time to do it, but it's, it's not unreasonable to see some turnover on your board. The key thing is, is the lack of engagement hampering the ability of the board and if it's just a small group of you making all the decisions then that doesn't feel terribly healthy. Thank you. Rui and then Philip. Um, yeah I, I, not very much again to add to what Rosalind said but I think you covered most things there. Um, I, I think the one thing I would say is if your strategies have changed and you need a different skill set then actually that is absolutely appropriate to have that churn on the board there is there is no problem with having that in my mind you know if you're if you are if you if you need a different set of skills on the board then that's not a bad time to be looking at it 
Um, not wanting to sound unkind, but if some people are stepping down because they they can't cope with the, the pandemic, there's there's something about also getting alongside the individual and, and not just dealing with it as as um, well. You've resigned from the board. Let's let's move on and see where we can recruit as well. You know, you will need to do that if the individual does need to step down. But also, is there something deeper that that you need to to, to find out with that individual, just to, to get alongside them. If you value them on the board and they've still got terms to serve, then actually there, there's a perhaps a different conversation to have first before you, you you go down some of those other avenues as well. So yeah, probably that, coming back to that personal resilience again and, and actually looking out for each other and, and um, yeah, that side of things too. So um, yeah, I mean, I just agreeing, Agreeing with with Rosalind and thinking that you know the people you want on the board are the people who want to be on a board, um, uh, and obviously they've they've got to want to be on the board for the right reasons. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons for, for being on boards, and um, I don't know, just just being on it uh, isn't the right reason. Uh, so um, p f finding out about people uh, is that before you bring them onto boards is quite important, and that leads me on to my. My next comment. We hear, uh, in fact, we've heard today from from, from Rosalind and, and Rui, very rightly about needing um, needing the right skills on the board and and looking for skills. And that is uh, all governance material will tell you uh, that that's what you're looking for: um, skills and experience. Um, and my view is that those are not the most important things on the board by a long, long way, um, but they are hugely important. Uh, and I often ask people what they think the most important things are, and no one ever quite kind of says it. But sometimes, eventually, people kind of get round to, to, to saying, "Yeah, it's judgment. What you what you need on a board is good judgment, uh, because somebody with good judgment can decide things effectively on the basis of good advice." And um, the you know the our executive teams are providing really, really good advice. So yes, you do want skills, you do want experience, but there are people with skills and experience who have zero judgment, um, and um, uh, or they, they have it, but they don't bring it into your board um, because perhaps they've left it all outside on some other board. And we've seen that, um, we've seen that before uh, in a number of cases. So um, think about how you will uh, try to find those people with that key quality as well, if you can. It's a pretty hard thing to do. Thank you, Philip. Um, we have another comment, which um, is aligned to this, which is in the current situation, recruiting is difficult, <clears throat> and finding people with the right skills has always been hard. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, practical advice would be very good on how we reach those people. And there's a question that's allied to that, which is to Alice. Um, where would she recommend that a charity advertises trustee vacancies so that they're seen by younger people? Really great questions. Um, so first of all, I would say obviously go to the Young Trustee Movement. They share opportunities so other young people um, can see those opportunities. Um, I would recommend using your standard channels. So Twitter and LinkedIn, there are young people that use them. But be very clear about who you are looking for. If you want a trustee that represents uh, Wales, put that in the application so you're being very clear and transparent. And then I would also say go out to some new channels. So dip your toe in with Instagram. That's where a lot of young people go or go directly to schools, universities, colleges. There are also if you are, for example, um, a healthcare charity, lots of NHS trusts now have their own youth groups Don't go directly to them with those opportunities and find those really engaged young people. Um, so it is possible. Um, and in terms of the recruitment, I appreciate that it's very challenging at the moment, but my um, recommendation there is say who you are looking for, be really specific um, and reach out to your networks. As a result of um, the pandemic and a trustees week, I've seen a lot of opportunities, especially for digital trustees wanting to get involved. Thank you, Alice. That's that's really helpful. Um, and I think the the ability, as you say, to reach people through these new 
<clears throat> and, and less used for it is, is really helpful, isn't it? I know that for healthcare, we've seen a real upsurge in people wanting to be involved and wanting to make a difference and be part of something meaningful and purposeful. Um, and uh, channeling that is, is something that we, we need to do more for because there are more people than there are opportunities sometimes, I think. So thank you for that. We've got a great question here for Rui. Um, which is which is about um, and, and a thank you Rui for your presentation um, and it says we're a small volunteer-led heritage centre turnover about 45,000 what key financial indicators would you suggest we should be looking at wow okay um, well without seeing your account seeing your management accounts it, it's hard to know where, where you're key income sources are but i'm sure you know those really well if you've got um if you've got a turnover of 45k you you'll know what makes that up um i would imagine for you the key indicators are going to be um they're going to be things like what when do you what can you do around your cost base while you can't have people coming in so are there are there things around um when are schemes closing when are people coming off furlough what are your current um the, the rates that you're currently getting back from from government i'm sounding a little bit vague because actually without knowing your accounts it's hard to be very specific um but going back to to the things that we that i spoke about in my presentation the cash flow is going to be your key bit so are you getting regular reports on what your bank balances are um, are you, you know, you, there's, there's no, you know, with online banking nowadays, you can have daily reports if you are that concerned about the urgency of your, your financial position. Um, so I, I think if, if you are that concerned, I would, I would start there. Um, but then you do move on to that cost and income side. Is there anything you can see in when lockdowns change that mean that you know when people will be able to come into your income? And this does come on to some of the scenario planning that you might look at. Some of the uh yes yeah, some of that side of things um I, i'd be really happy to talk to whoever that is separately um because it, i'm sounding a bit woolly and vague because it's it's hard to know exactly what you might be what you might be needing to to look at there if you're small volunteer led um 45 000 income it's about protecting that income for now it's about making sure that you've got cash coming in it's about making sure that you can keep the lights on and you can keep what you're trying to deliver to people in your area for the future so yeah uh, vague very happy to have a conversation separately about that that sounds i'm quite un unhappy with that one so apologies for that but i i think thank you Rui. that's been really helpful i think it's that that the questions that you're asking are the ones that we would want to ask ourselves. So I think as somebody coming from a small charity myself, I think that's that's really helpful. And yeah, building but, um, on that, think, we have yeah. um, a question here about scenario planning. Um, of, of, um, the question is, I'd like to hear more about scenario planning during this uncertain time. Do you have any further thoughts on this? Who'd like yeah. to come in? Yeah, really? I, yeah, I'm, I'm happy, you know, because I think this might be where this question probably ends up anyway. But, it, you know, I think we, we can see from the, the the daily briefings we get from government around the different scenarios that government is looking at, that you can you can plot so many scenarios and there are so many variables there that it is during uncertain times. It can be really, really hard. I think. I think when you're looking at scenario planning it's almost going back to to some of the things you would do as a trustee board strategically um one of one of the most useful teams tools to, to perhaps revisit would be your swot analysis of your organization and particularly the opportunities and threats side of things because if you actually go into that and look at well what where are the opportunities for cfg we've looked at um the opportunity that that COVID has forced us to look at in terms of delivering our conferences and our events digitally, that's an opportunity because it can increase the reach and, and the support that we provide to treasurers and finance people much further than we can ever do by face-to-face -face stuff. So there is an opportunity there. 
um, as well as there being a threat from that side of things. So I think there is um, a first step of, of revisiting potentially your SWOT analysis. That's not about rewriting your strategy, but that is about looking at that one particular tool and seeing how that can help you to identify, well, well then if these are the opportunities and these are the threats, let's model those in some of the scenarios that we look at going forward. We've, um, for us in terms of the threat side of things, then we've then looked at, well, if those threats crystallize, what decisions do we need to take beyond that? So it's, it's having that clear thought out process of what happens beyond that as well. So look at the threats, look at the opportunities, model those and, and don't have too many. Otherwise you'll lose yourself in just data rather than information informing you to go forward. So opportunities, threats, scenario planning, and decision points after the threat side of things it has been modeled. Thank you, Rui. And Ros? Forgot to unmute, sorry about that. Um, I think scenario planning is really powerful. And I, I, I think what's, what's really important is to figure out what are the key areas of uncertainty that are going to make the most difference? And um, certainly the methodology we've used is this idea that you find a particular thing where you're really not sure which way it's going to go. Um, and then say, well, what would we do if it went that way? And what would we do if it went that way? And see what the difference actually is. Because if actually it doesn't make any difference, those are the things you can go ahead with. It, it's figuring out what, you know, what, what's common to all your scenarios, if there is anything common to all those scenarios. Um, so I think figuring out, first of all, having a debate about what are our key axes of uncertainty, and then kind of exploring, well, what happens at either end of those? And I think quite often just having two axes, just four scenarios can be quite powerful. Um, as Ruby says, I, I just would say, don't do too many. Um, or certainly not at one time. Wise advice there. Um, let me bring, there's a question here for Philip. Um, Philip, are you able to give an idea or recommendations on where to begin trying to identify potential organisations for collaboration and or merger? Um, thanks for that question. There's some irony to that question because I think probably about six months ago, um, uh, I, I had this idea that we ought to set up a register of potential mergers, uh, and I did quite a long time, a long, a lot of thinking about how that register of, of, of mergers might go and how it might be kept by an organisation such as I posited um, NCVO um, as a um, as, as a, a, an honest and confidential broker, because not everyone wants these conversations to be out in the public, uh, and for obvious reasons. Uh, that, that such a thing does not yet exist, and I have not had the time, because uh, I've instead, um, with the encouragement of NCVO, concentrated on drafting our, or creating our decision, crisis decision tool, which you'll see a link to at the end of this. Um, but I still think that, that there is a... Oh, I think we've, I think, have we frozen there, Philip? I'm going to, I'm going to move us on and then hopefully um, we'll be there able... There's a need for that. Your question, uh, a non-disclosure agreement and have a, a, a confidential discussion about how it might work. Uh, Philip, I think there's a need. We, uh, Philip, it, we lost you. a sector you. body to do it or one of the sector funders, perhaps, that's interesting. Philip, we lost you just briefly, so I'm going to ask you to start again when you come back to us. Bear with me, and we'll just move on a little bit. Um, interesting here, why does the panel feel board diversity is still such an issue? And I can see a big smile on Alice's face there. Yes, uh, I would really love to talk about this. Um, so we have stats from the Charity Commission that 
um, are alarming and kind of really show us that we don't have full diversity at all. So as I mentioned, 3% of trustees are under the age of 30. That's what we categorise as the young trustee. 92% of trustees are white. Two thirds of trustees are men. The average board age is, I believe, 55 to 64. And finally, 75% of trustees have a household income that is above the average median in the UK. All of this puts together a picture of a board of trustees that unfortunately do not re represent our society at all. Um, and that's what we need to change here. Hopefully that they speak for themselves. Thank you. And Ros, can we... Yeah, great question. Thank you. I, th I think the honest answer is we don't have the diversity because we haven't prioritised it. Um, some people have talked about it a lot. Some have acted, but as a whole, I think we haven't prioritised it. We haven't put the effort in. We do the things that are easy. You know, the research shows that time and time again, people go to their existing networks, they don't advertise, and they don't actively go and look for people. Um, and I think we do need to work harder at going beyond the usual channels. I think the other issue is often the focus is very much on at this point in time, we need somebody now rather than building a pipeline of people and building talent, bringing them onto working groups, getting to know people, building relationships with communities that you want to recruit from. But also what you see as being the role of that trustee who's different to your existing board, once they're on the board, how are you supporting them? How open are you genuinely to their new perspectives that they're bringing? Or have you you've just done this for a tick box? Are you genuinely open to learning and bringing on board what they have to say, to changing the way you think about things, um, and, and not being tokenistic about it, as Alice touched on in her comments, so that being perhaps bringing on two or three people who can really change the culture of your board. Um, I would just give a plug to we're we're making free this week our guide to working one to one with trustees and we have this idea of a trustee recruitment cycle about drawing people in supporting them uh developing them and moving them on and that's free at the moment so do do go have a look at our website and download and it also has some more resources and pointer signposts to others who can help with recruitment getting on board this week has published a good new guide on on uh, trustee recruitment as well, as well as trustees unlimited and, and reach. Thank you, that's, that's really helpful. Philip, I'm so sorry we lost you there and I'd, I'd, be, I'd be really grateful if you would start again because you were get, you're getting to a really uh, important part. And there's a, there's a related um, question about um, tools for boards who are, um, that support boards to work collaboratively, either formally or informally. So maybe we can pick that up as well. Yeah, can you hear me? Good. Um, so I'm so sorry, my internet just uh, collapsed. I shan't um, embarrass my provider. Um, so uh, I think did, did you, I think I got to the point where I was talking about um, the association of chairs and how you. No, maybe not. No. Not quite. So uh, I had talked you'd, about you'd, you'd mentioned the very good opportunity for NCVO to to uh, yes. <laughs> be part of, uh, of sharing. So I think that. Um, uh, there is a need for, I, I think there is a need for a, um, a, a sector body, uh, and I thought NCBO would be an ideal one, but of course they've got a million things to do. You have a million things to do and, and you can't do everything. Um, to set something like that up, uh, or perhaps one of the sector funding bodies that is interested in promoting good governance and, and so on, and the effectiveness and efficiency of, of charities. And I'm very willing to talk to anyone uh, about trying to set something like that up. Uh, people are nervous because there's a great deal of, of effort needs to go into it um, to get it up and running. But I think it, it could work. In the meantime, there are um, sector bodies that people engage with. And I would have thought two really obvious ones are the Association of Chairs, um, where you will your chairs will be able to discuss this. And you know, it, it should be on their minds and they should they will meet other people doing similar work. There is Akivo, where chief executives um, can, can meet. There's the Honorary Treasurer's Forum, 
So a number of these forums where you, you meet people, where people are very willing to have very open and off the record conversations, uh, because this is an incredibly supportive and helpful sector where people are not cutting each other's throats to get ahead. Um, they are thinking about um, how they can best deliver uh, and they are willing to have those conversations, but there's no formal mechanism. As to uh, the related question, if you look on NCBO's website, you'll find guidance on um, mergers and collaboration. If you look on, um, there's a, a useful guide published by IVAR, um, I-V-A-R, uh, there's stuff on our website. Uh, so there's quite a lot of useful stuff about, um, mostly it's about managing those sorts of um, arrangements, getting in rather than getting on. Um, but I think when you when you do these sorts of things, particularly collaboration, I always tell people, well, I didn't tell you at the beginning of this, but I normally tell people, um, thinking about collaboration, think about getting in, getting on, and getting out. Um, all of those, that, those are the sort of three stages of, of, of thinking. But anyway, most of the literature is about getting in. Thank you very much, Philip. That was really helpful. Um, we have a question now about um, resilience. Um, uh, I would like to ask a question about sharing these insights on resilience. We're in this webinar because we're engaged and somewhat perhaps to a dwindling extent, personally resilient practitioners and researchers, but how do we bring those along with us in creating more resilient cultures? Roz, can I invite you in? Because I think you, you started us on very well on this conversation. Okay, I think it's a great question. And I think it's it's often the case in our charity world, isn't it, that the people who most need our help and advice are the people, we're not always in touch with the people who most need our help and advice and messaging. Um, so I guess one thing that, that's practical is is that everybody on this call talks about it at their board agenda so you know if, if resilience isn't on the agenda isn't something you talked about hopefully it already is as you say if you're the kind of people who are turning up you're, you're probably already putting it on the agenda um i, I know certainly akivo putting re events on around this we've been putting on events around this ncvo have um i think it's a it's a comms question i don't think i have an answer i think it's a great question i don't have a, a ready answer than that all of us I, I guess it's about making it okay to talk about it um uh yeah that would be as much as i can offer um i would just like to add to Rosa's point because i completely agree with that um the only other thing i would maybe suggest is question things so um for example when organizations recruit for new trustees and they fit this um this background of people from a higher education who um, fit all those stats that we mentioned ask them questions around what they did to um, make their recruitment more inclusive ask, ask them questions and be challenging but in a approachable way so we can then again create this society where we talk openly and make sure that those people that are letting these things slide by um, are being held to account. Thank you. And there's a related question, um, <clears throat> which is, what are the signs that suggest that personal individual resilience is being extremely tested and that the best option is that the trustee should um, step aside? Um, you're asking us all to be amateur psychologists here, um, <laughs> uh, and I, I, I just say that to say that I really don't feel qualified to um, to, to 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 make that call. I'm afraid. Well, I feel as if I should step forward, really, with my general practice background and talk about <laughs> how people come with with resilience. But I think the very fact that you're asking the question that it's occurring to you that you're picking up that there's something that might be not right. And as I think all of you have said, having that first conversation that says, how are things going? 
what's working, what isn't. It's very interesting to see who's really unexpectedly thrived in a in a virtual environment and who's unexpectedly found it much more difficult those sorts of things so um i think the very fact that people are asking the question is really important um i'd, I'd just say you probably be surprised by the answers that you get um it's n not necessarily um where, where you think the problems lie um, I have a question here about um, sorry, Chris, emotion. Can I, can I just, oh, sorry. Can I just add, 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 or ask a question then in relation to that? Or I, mean, I, I think the audience can't easily answer; they have to type their answers. But um, we talk about mental health. R Rui mentioned it, and, and um, a number of people have mentioned uh, the importance of, of uh, taking care of people's mental health. And there are uh, things like um, mental health first aiders and. Uh, and people put in place, you know, the opportunity to have counselling and, you know, on a confidential basis and all sorts of things. These are offered to staff. I'm interested because I don't think I've ever thought of or even seen them being offered to trustees. Um, and we're perhaps not thinking about trustees. Is, is that happening? Well, you've, you've picked up there on a question that's come through, which is what are the key emotions that are being exhibited by the Board of Trustees during this crisis? Anger, fear, grief. And how are they being addressed? Ros? I'm just thinking, partly also responding to Philip's point about support for trustees. I think there is absolutely a need to support trustees and chairs as well. I mean, it's one of the reasons we were set up as an organisation um, my co-founder and I set us up because we could see chairs with the, the Cinderella's of the sector. You know, the, there's been an organisation for chief executives for a long time and quite rightly, but no support for chairs. And obviously, partly that's what we're here for, to help people. And certainly we've we've been dealing with some chairs who are under a lot of stress at the moment, finding it very difficult. Um, and we certainly encourage um, in, in the best of times, but particularly during the pandemic, that you have social time with your trustees. And that includes at the beginning of your meetings, virtually, certainly in our um, board meetings, we all go into groups of two or three at the beginning of the meeting to connect with each other personally, just talk about what's what's going on. So recreate that kind of thing that you would do um, if you're having coffee together or where you were you know, getting your cup of tea before the board meeting. Those kinds of personal connections are really important. Our chair certainly has one-to-ones with trustees. It's continuing that through the pandemic. Obviously, a lot of work on him to do that. Um, I mentioned we've we've set up an employee assistance program. It's actually available to our trustees as well, and that covers help with um, the CBT available, counselling, um, also help with debt and finance and bereavement. I mean, it's cost us. Uh, 500 600 pounds for a year which in the scheme of things obviously realize some people can't afford that in the scheme of things pretty good value for money um the other thing we've put in place is that there's a buddying arrangement going on between we're only a small staff team five of us and every staff member has a trustee buddy um just to give pastoral support uh, which is, I think, works quite well both ways because I think it gives the trustees an insight into what's going on for staff, but it gives staff space as well. And that's the kind of thing I think I think we could build on. Uh, so I realise I've mentioned mostly answered Philip's question. I think in terms of which emotions, I think we're seeing the whole gamut. Um, uh, my feeling is that that underlying most of it is is some kind of anxiety, and for some people that that can come out in anger and frustration and picking up on Rui's point, I think some people's response to anxiety is to seek more and more information because it makes you feel more secure, um, which can be a nightmare if you're a staff member, continually churning out more information which actually isn't delivering what pe people need. And, and for others, it comes out as blame uh, and for others as withdrawal. So I think we're seeing the whole gamut of um, emotions in the boardroom. Thank you, Roz. We have a few more questions about the board and dynamics, and I just like to. And so I think we'll we'll come back to those. 
there's one here that um, I've I've missed, so I'd like us to go back to that. Please bear with me. And that is, are there guidelines for investing reserves? Um, we're in a good position financially and currently not really using our financial position effectively. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming everybody's going to hope I'll take that one. Um, the, I, I think that there's no clear one answer about how you should be investing your reserves. Um, a, a lot of that is going to be based on what you're looking to achieve, what your, uh, what your risks are, what you need to have in, in a liquid state to, to be able to, to access quickly if you need to. Um, so it's, it's very hard to come up with a, a single answer. I think the way that we normally build this is, is we say, um, well, what's your financial strategy? You then build uh, a reserves policy on top of that, and then an investment policy on top of that. So you probably go through those different steps of saying, what's our financial strategy? And therefore, what do we need reserves for? What do they help us to achieve? What do they protect us against? And then once you know what you're holding your reserves for, that informs your investment strategy as the last piece of that. So I'd probably suggest if, if, if this is a question you're looking at, going through those steps. And, and But that first part is probably going to be the most uncertain bit right now. What is your financial strategy? We've spoken a lot about what the sort of things you need to do in scenario planning, et cetera, to know what your financial strategy is for the short, medium and long term. And it might be that when you get to the end of doing that financial strategy piece, um, you look at your reserves and say, we need to hold some very liquidly to, to just cover us through some of the, the next six to 12 months and some of the uncertainty we're gonna hold there. And that will then in, um, inform where and what you would invest that money in, how liquid you need those resources to be. Banks, investment managers, they can all then help you with that top level once you've got to that, but I'd probably suggest that you work through it in, in that sort of sequence, financial strategy, reserves policy, investment policy. Thank you, Rui. I'm going to come back um, to some of the questions about the board and dynamics and supporting through. Um, so we've had uh, an, a conversation about supporting the mental health of board and staff when everybody's under pressure um, and Ros you started to to speak a little about how um, you've built relationships and dynamics of the board remotely and uh, we have a question here um, that asks about away days away days have always made a real difference for our organization in the past but are not currently possible um, do others have um, advice about building dynamics remotely Please, yeah, it's interesting. Um, the questioner says away days aren't possible remotely. Actually, we've managed to have some online workshops and I, I know others have. So obviously it's going to depend on your circumstances, on the digital skills of your board members. Um, but if you have got access to online um, resources, Zoom, etc. There's some really good interactive tools like interactive whiteboards, breakout groups. Um, if if you don't have the skills, there are facilitators uh, who can help you with that. We've certainly found that, that that it's been possible to do some really quite inventive things where people can can still put up their post-its on a, a whiteboard. You can move them around. You can group them. It takes more creativity um certainly the first time i'd done a, a, a strategy workshop online but it is possible um so it, it's so specifically in terms of away days i, I think breakout room, rooms work brilliantly uh it's a, you know you can you can have a round of questions where you you put people into different sized groups you get them to focus on that come back so you can use all those kind of classic classic techniques um, I think the other thing is just about focusing on the one-to-one -one relationships and maybe encouraging trustees to ring each other 
Um, or if you've got a vice chair, take some of the load off the chair, be doing some of those one-to-one -one calls to touch in with where people are, what's important to them. Get people involved in constructing the board agenda as well. Uh, probably you need to give more time to meaty items to give people uh, more space to get into those. So it, it may be you need to change the pattern of your meetings. So perhaps you need to meet more frequently, but for shorter periods. Uh, build in breaks into the uh, board meetings as well. If you can, I think setting up the board room and the board meeting so that you can see everybody, investing time in helping people understand how to set up their screen so they can do things like see all the speakers in galleries or have a technical training session for people. Um, those, all those little things on their own aren't enough, but if you add them all together, I think they really help with the keeping the dynamics and that sense of personal connection going. That's really helpful, Ross. And I think um, just to, oh, let me bring Philip in first. So, I, uh, yeah, all that sounds absolutely brilliant. It's a really difficult question. I was just going to um, then resile from my position of I can't be an amateur psychologist um, and uh, and just say something amateur psychologist -y, uh, which uh, is how much better we all I mean it's, it's obvious really but how much better we all respond to knowing that we're doing a good job and how rarely we are told that uh, how much it's assumed that of course the job we're doing is um, that's what we're there for um, but we need to be telling each other we're doing well uh, and, and uh, the role of the chair I think is hugely important in that in that um, people will um, naturally look up to the chair because they know that the chair has vested in him or her a uh, certain degree of authority and will have more knowledge and more engagement about what's going on. And the chair taking that time with people um, is important. But please don't forget chairs. It's such a lonely place. The chief executive and the chair is such a lonely position. Uh, with people making just assumptions about them getting on and and, uh, and and all sorts of comments about how they're doing. They need to be told that they're doing well. Such good advice, Philip. And I think um, just building on that, a reflection from um, remote away days. One of the thing, one of the bits of feedback that people gave was that it was so nice, actually, to have the opportunity for equality of airtime. Um, so when you're in the room, um, the, the way in which the dynamic can build can mean that certain voices are not quite as heard. And you, as a chair, you work hard to be sure you're scanning the room and you're making sure that you bring everybody in. Um, but one of the joys of being able to go around and invite people to have airtime digitally um, was that the, those who felt more um, a bit more reticent, really enjoyed it. And it was interesting that it took the quality of the conversation down different routes and it, it was a it was a um, it felt very new. So I I would echo Ros's encouragement to look at how a, an away day might be possible digitally. Um, I'm just going to bring us now to our next question, which is about um, continuity, and that is Again, with uncertain times, um, the view that there's likely to be churn of CEOs and senior leaders, and what should trustees be doing to ensure organisational knowledge is not lost and a smooth transition um, is enabled to ensure least disruption? Um, shall I, I'll, I'll start. We all, I think, possibly have something to say. Uh, uh, Try, trying to develop a succession plan is a good thing for all organizations to do so that people are not, um, you're not having unexpected leavings as much as possible. But even when you do, you've got a process for what happens when somebody leaves uh, and how you go about finding their successor. So you're trying to create overlap. Um, you're trying to, you, you, you've got your, um, uh, questions that you raise of people leaving and down and, and, and getting their their, their knowledge um, so yeah uh, that it's it's more difficult uh, with 
um, trustees who've been there for, for many years and particularly chairs and a chair transition where there may then be quite a significant different uh, you know, new, new approach on the board or, or a way in which the board operates. But the, these things are all about planning uh, and just creating the, um, the succession plan will help you think about the questions you should be asking and how you create overlap, I would say. Not sure. Oh, we lost. Period I'm, I'm so sorry. I, um, that was just a slight move there to try and plug myself in so that I didn't lose power. I'm so sorry about that. Rui, please, next. Uh, yeah, I, I was just going to, I think, um, just building on what Philip said there, I think it's, it's intentionality in how you manage those transitions, both in the succession planning beforehand for, for senior leaders, CEOs, trustees, whatever it happens to be, but it's also the intentionality of how you onboard people into the organisation. Alice said it earlier that actually she had a, a great induction into um, the charity that she's with now, that actually they had, they showed her the services they delivered, they they actually took her through that, that induction, so that that having that intentionality and planning for that intentional transfer of knowledge as you come in is something that that I think most organizations should should have in place. Um, not a lot do. It's, it's you know the number of organizations I've I've gone and joined and actually the induction is well here's your computer and here's your access to your finance system. It'd be quite frightening. But actually, it's, if you're intentional about it, that can really help. That and particularly if this is, if you know there's going to be churn, plan for it. Plan for it. Ross. Yeah, I think the other thing I would add is, uh, and it, it, this is obvious, but you know, really good handover notes uh, really help. I think also it, it, having a good disaster recovery plan. So, because at the moment, let's be realistic, probably with everything else that's going on, you are going to lose. You know, we, trying, at the moment, we're not able to do everything perfectly. So we may need to lower our expectations. And But ideally, we will keep that knowledge. But I would certainly make sure you're focused on, if you don't have it, a disaster rec recovery plan. You know, what are, what are the absolutely key systems and key bits of knowledge? And make sure that you, you get that from somebody before they go. Because particularly, it, it depends on the scenario in which people are leaving whether it's a happy scenario where they're, they're leaving on good terms or whether it's been a, an abrupt loss of staff, either be, because of some disruption or because there's been a breakdown in the relationship. So I think that's where the disaster recovery plan and having really clear understanding of who's got key passwords, who's the only person who knows what that key system, uh, how it works and what to do, it, do when it goes wrong. If you've got that plan in place, very early on make sure you've got your backup arrangements in place so so i'm going to the kind of extreme end uh, but that would be my first priority if things are a bit calmer then great handover notes circulated to everybody in the team before the person goes and make sure all the links to the key documents are working um, and just ask those kind of idiot questions before they go and then all the other good things that people have talked about about the induction um, and the succession planning Thank you very much, Roz. And I'm going to move us now to what I think will probably be our final question for this morning. Um, so it's one thing which people in my circle have said is that trustees should be paid to ensure responsibility. Do you have any thoughts on this? Who'd like to come in um, first? Alex. I can touch briefly um i personally don't have a particular thought what i would say uh, around equality and accessibility is if we want to have um all people on boards and it to be fully representative uh, we need to consider the fact that um people won't be able to give up their time um, for free in some cases. So we need to consider that um, possibility so we can improve diversity even more. Thank you. 
Philip, did you have thoughts about the pros and cons of paying trustees? Um, it sounds like I have just arrived back on the call after my internet collapsed again, just, just at the question I thought might be directed at me, picking up the end of uh, Alice's comments there. Um, yes, I do. I've got very firm views about, about all of this, uh, quite outspoken in the minds of some people. Uh, firstly, I don't think that paying trustees is necessary to get good trustees. Um, uh, and uh, I've, I've never really bought the argument of that. I've made that argument um, many times uh, on behalf of clients uh, when they need to do it. But I don't necessarily think, uh, and for them it was a valid argument, but it, it, it's not something that I've ever thought particularly important. I think you can always find good trustees. Um, I, I think it's getting more difficult because of the, the things that trustees face. What I do think though, is that uh, the burden faced by trustees uh, is unreasonable at the moment. Uh, and I have suggested an entirely new form of governance for organisations that feel that, which I've called the assured unitary governance model. Um, and if you send me an email, I can send you a, a, a link to an article I've put on that, or you can see it on our, our website um, under the title assured unitary governance, where what I've suggested is that actually the people taking decisions um, who are running the charity and know everything about the charity are the executive and uh, they should be trustees. And they shouldn't be paid because they're trustees. They should be trustees because they are engaged in and, and taking important decisions. And that we move the trustee board into a, um, a, different, uh, a different role, essentially a role um, as a sort of assurance board uh, that I think most trustees think that they already occupy. Anyhow, no time to go into it in great detail, uh, but do have a look if you're interested in a different Form of governance. It's really helpful, Philip. And, and uh, just a reflection, having led um, sort of corporate teams, how valuable being a trustee is to your day job. And I know that we were trying to build that opportunity for employees into their roles to allow them to be released. And, that, and that's something I, I, I personally feel very passionate about. It, it makes such a difference to how people behave and how they, what, the, what, their, what their life experiences are. And I think that's, that's um, really helpful and, and speaks to both, both your points. And um, we'll look, thank you everybody. I, um, I think that's all that we're going to have time for this morning in terms of questions. And I'd really, want to thank all of our panellists for what has been a really helpful and interesting morning, sharing your insights, answering our questions. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. We hope you found it informative, that you have some practical actions to take away and implement. And um, just a, a, a note to say that there are a couple of slides at the end of the pre presentation, which signpost to further resources. Um, so do have a look at those. We've, we've worked quite hard to make sure that they're really um, valuable and, and hopefully they will be. Um, also a reminder that we've recorded this session, so we'll send you a link to the recording as well as to a feedback survey. As you anticipate, I'm going to ask you please to give us feedback. We're really grateful. It will really help us to build on what we can bring. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, huge thank you again to our, our panellists and to Claire Legg and Rapinda Dalliwell for making this possible. Um, and to all of you for joining us and for fantastic questions. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Trustee Week. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Priya, for sharing it so brilliantly. Thank You're you, Priya. You're very kind, Philip. Thank you, panellists. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.